cover in your car and if you open your windows and you dust, your dust rag looks green and yellow. That's oak right now. That's tree pollen. That's the one that really gets me. Okay? Here's what's supposed to happen over time. The red are going to be the tr tree pollen situation. Look where we are now. Look where we're going to be. And this is scary because what this picture is showing you is that upstate New York, where we mostly have pine trees right now, by the end of the century, it's going to be mostly hardwoods. Pine trees are going to be at higher altitudes where it's cooler, but they're going to run out of elevation eventually. So the hardwoods are taking over. Now, is that a bad thing? I feel like hardwoods it isn't. If you're allergic, it's a terrible thing. But do we have the right to decide which type of tree we want in New York State? That's really what it comes down to. Do we have that right? Well, closer to home, West Nile, going to be on the increase because mosquitoes like very hot summers that are punctuated with flooding rains. It's exactly the type of summer the Northeast has been having and we're expected to continue to have. Heat waves and then occasionally that big thunderstorm and flooding rains, you get ponding water. Mosquitoes love that, so a greater chance of West Nile. Ticks, you've already heard about this year, right? The ticks are crazy this year. Okay? They're crazy. In fact, I had a student, it was weird. In fact, he's here, right? Where are you? Yeah. Right there. He was talking about, I can't believe I had a tick on me. And after we were done with the conversation, there was a tick crawling on the ground. So he's a tick magnet. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, that just came right like that. <laughs> that's not probably the magnet you want to be, but that's the magnet you want. Uh, so ticks, ticks are going to be bad news for us here. Oh, spiders. Look at that nasty bite. That is nasty. There are only two poisonous spiders in the United States, the black widow and the brown recluse. Now, there are sporadic brown recluse in the Northeast, but it's not a common spider. The scary thing about brown recluse is it looks like the normal brown spider you always shake out of your shoe or you see on your clothes or something, or your four-year-old thinks is an insect he can play with, right? And you know spider bites generally are pretty nasty. The brown recluse is super nasty. It actually chews up your flesh. It's a flesh-eating bite. Some people die. They have an allergic reaction and die. So brown recluse, you can tell because if you look, get really close. I'm sure we're all going to do this. You get really close. It looks like there's a violin or a bass fiddle on its back. Okay, so if you're, if you're brave enough to get close and examine that, that's how you know. Okay, but I got a feel that once we know brown recluse are in here, you're going to be whacking every brown spider you see. <laughs> Right? So, there was a study done recently that showed how the brown recluse are going to move with temperatures. They can't live, they need a certain type of temperature. That type of temperature, for the most part, is in the south and the central part of the country. The dark blue is where they're going to move over time. And so these states, which generally aren't good for brown recluse now, in 20 or 30 years are going to start to become home for the brown recluse. Now, brown recluse don't chase you around the house and bite them. <laughs> okay, you have to come to them, but they're going to be there. It's kind of like people in Arizona, before they put their slippers on in the morning, they have to shake it to see if there's a scorpion in there. You might have to do that with brown recluse. Okay? It's like, you know, how many of you have been bitten by a spider at some point? Right, so it happens. If it's a brown recluse, it can get really nasty. Okay? Raise your hand if you're a skier. How'd you like this year? <laughs> you didn't go, did you? How much money do you think the ski industry lost this year? Well, this is this year. And if you look at these plots, red is by the end of the century, blue is where we are now. So instead of about 19 inches, we're expecting an average of 4 or 5 inches of snow. So you're going to see this more and more. So winters are getting narrower in their time frame. and Generally, as you move toward the middle and end of the century, it'll be warm enough to have more rainstorms. And you know if you're a skier, that's bad news because even if it freezes up after, now you have ice instead of powder. Okay. There's going to be fewer trails opener. Conditions are bad. They're going to have to raise lift fees to not go out of business. So believe it or not, you're going to pay more to ski on worse conditions for fewer days. And I, I, when I was researching this, I didn't realize New York State actually has more Industry from skiing, number of skiers than any other state in the country. I would have guessed Colorado or someplace like California. New York State is number one. Four million visitors, a billion dollars to the economy. You know that we didn't see anywhere near that this year. I mean, New York State took a hit. We're in a fiscal crisis, and that didn't help. 
Okay? Now, you can counteract that with, well, we didn't have a lot of snow removal policies. Right? But the ski industry is huge. So, are there any winners in climate change? Well, we know spiders and uh, ticks and West Nile. Some people like to say CO2 is good for plants. It's plant food. Well, yeah, at natural levels, but if we keep raising CO2, it gets too hot, and plants can't survive the heat, and worse, there's drought, and they're dead. Water is going to be more important to plants than CO2, and we know there are going to be water shortages. Okay? So are there some plants that like CO2, poison ivy? Not only does it viney type of plants do, not only does poison ivy spread faster with CO2, the actual poison that makes the itch is more potent at, high, at higher CO2 levels. Now, I can tell you, in 2010, I was constantly battling the poison ivy on the other side of the fence. It kept trying to come up underneath. And at the time, my son was three. He was actually pulling a vine out from under the fence, poison ivy in his hands. <laughs> so, no, not to grab, don't touch me, that kind of a thing. So, you know, again, we actually, I'm surprised the number of people who don't know what poison ivy is. My neighbor walks in it all the time, and I have to keep reminding. by the way, poison ivy. But kids definitely don't, right? Uh, how many of you have driven to the south and seen kudzu? Raise your hand. Kudzu. It's called the vine that ate the south. It covers everything and it kills the tree underneath because it blocks the sunlight. And in fact, just like here in New York, every week or so you mow your grass because it gets tall, in the south they cut back the kudzu every week. Because if they don't, it will take over the entire property. It will cover their house. It, it, it's crazy. It grows almost like bamboo. And we already have kudzu in Long Island. We already have this, and it's going to increase. Uh, New York's big dairy production. So as it gets hotter and hotter, cows don't produce as much milk. And it's estimated that by the end of the century, we're going to decrease milk production by sixfold unless farmers add air conditioning to their barns. Well, that means more expensive farming, which means more expensive milk. And what's air conditioning going to do? Cause more global warming. So you see, the, this, every time you try to cool off, you're actually making it get hotter. So it's money, money, money. Okay? A lot of small communities in upstate New York, their entire economy is based on trout fishing. The water gets too warm, trout can't survive. Bass will come in. But there aren't nearly as many bass enthusiasts, and the bass fishing is not nearly as lucrative as trout fishing. So they're going to have to adjust and probably take a hit. Right? And you can see we're looking at you know millions of dollars. Here. Okay. So raise your hand if over your lifetime you think gas prices have been going down steadily. <laughs> For now. Well, yeah, they actually did just tick down a three days. However, think back 20 years, 10 years, just five years, they're going up. Why do you think gas prices are going up over time? Well, more people need it. It's harder to find. There's also speculation, some other things. But the fact is, we don't have an endless supply of oil. Now, there are television commercials right now saying there's a tremendous amount of oil. It's going to create jobs, blah, blah, blah. So I say... If oil is that plentiful and easy to find, why are you guys going 12 miles offshore and sticking a pipe two miles into the ocean? <laughs> That's hard to do. If it's so easy to find and so... It isn't. And that's one of the reasons gas prices are getting higher. Okay? So gas prices are doing this. Okay? Why should we base our economy on an energy source that's dwindling and getting more expensive? And guess where a lot of the oil comes from? Countries that don't like us. In fact, <laughs> 10 of the countries we currently import oil from are on the list of countries the government says Americans should not go to. And half, actually it's more than half, half of our trade deficit is imported fossil fuels. Half of our entire trade deficit is imported fossil fuels. So we're throwing money at a source that's in a dangerous country, getting more expensive, and dwindling. Is the sun going out in the next couple hundred years? No. Is the wind going to stop blowing in the next couple hundred years? Hope not. Are the waves going to stop moving? Is the earth going to suddenly lose its interior heat? 
No. So these are what we call renewable sources. Essentially, it's infinite supply of energy. And all of them are getting cheaper with time. So it seems just sort of common sense financially, right? You might think, all right, Scott, you're not telling me something because this is just too obvious. If the sun is forever, it's getting cheaper, why aren't we all doing solar? Well, the reason is, is that although it's cheaper per kilowatt hour, we don't have the infrastructure in place. We don't have massive solar panels distributed all over the country, piped into the grid to power our homes. We do have things connected to coal plants, nuke, natural gas. So the upfront costs are the expensive part. Once it's up and running, it's absolutely a cheaper way to go. But we have to pay up front to get the money in the long run. And unfortunately, we generally are, what's coming out of my wallet now is what people think about, not, gee, how much is this going to save me down the road? And that's the problem. And the government is subsidizing the oil companies. ExxonMobil in 2012 makes $112 million in profit per day. So today, when we strike 11.59 p.m., ExxonMobil, after they've done all their expenses and income, is going to clear $112 million. And your tax dollars are helping them out because they're struggling so much. Okay, so now I'm not suggesting your tax dollars should support solar, but I am suggesting it shouldn't support oil. They're making money. That's like going to the bank and saying, I know you guys are hurting here. Have a couple of bucks today. <laughs> right? All right, so what do we got to do here? What we have to do is put a price on carbon. Right now, carbon is not priced correctly, meaning that the costs of climate change are not factored into the price of gas. For example, gas is actually very cheap. If you go to other countries around the world, they think, wow, you guys do $4 a gallon? You're lucky. Go to Europe. It's a lot more expensive. That's why in Europe you don't see any SUVs. You see little cars with turbos and diesels. It's cheaper, right? So what you do is you, you allow companies to have a certain amount of pollution. You put a price for each ton of carbon. Let's just say it's $20 per ton of carbon. That's your allowance. You are allowed to fill that circle with CO2. If you don't fill the circle, what's left over, you can sell to a company that knows they're going to go outside the circle. So let's say it's $20 per ton, and you have 100 tons that you didn't pollute that you were allowed to. You can sell that to this company who knows that because they're going outside the circle, their fine is greater than $20 per ton. So the idea is companies that figure out how to reduce their CO2 are going to profit. Companies that pollute away and don't really get up to speed are going to spend too much money. This is free market. This company wins because of ingenuity. This company loses because they're too slow. And then the idea is every year you lower, you shorten up that circle, make it smaller and smaller and smaller. So at some time in the future, there's little to no CO2 because the profits of this company, now they can invest in renewables. This actually is an idea that the Republican Party promoted. And this is the idea that they voted down when the Democrats said, we actually think this might work. <laughs> okay? Now, personally, I don't like this system because the money is being made by the people who are doing the polluting, the market, companies. I don't like this, but I'm a realist. We are never going to get legislation to price carbon in this country if it isn't free market. It's just not going to happen. These companies aren't going to do it. And the big issue now is, is that coal-fired power plants, which are polluting the most, they want the government to give them the money to clean up their act, and the environmentalists say, no, you can't reward them for their history of polluting. But I got to tell you, even though I consider myself an environmentalist, I will take a bad deal with coal companies over the current no deal like that. That's my personal opinion. This is where we have debate, because I'm getting into policy now. Everybody has a position on this. But you'll see in the next slide, most economists agree we've got to put a price on carbon. Okay? The reason why is when you actually do the studies, 
doing nothing is going to be more expensive than doing something. Definitely going to be more expensive. When you look at the economists who actually understand climate science, and they do this for a living, and they do the economics of climate, more than half say the United States should do something regardless if China, India, or anybody else does anything. Okay? And then when you add in that if China and India get on board, now you're looking at three out of four economists. What's generally stopping us right now is the, well, what about China? What about China? So how I respond to that question is, the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere today, more of that came from the United States than from any country on the planet. Even today, per person, we're blowing away China. Individually, you guys emit more CO2 than an individual Chinese person. Now, China, because they have billion plus people, and they're ramping up their factories to make your technology, so to speak, they will eventually be the number one carbon emitter. However, every item in your home that's stamped made in China caused some CO2 to be released. That's not Chinese CO2, that's your CO2. If you didn't buy it, they wouldn't have to make it, that CO2 wouldn't be in the atmosphere. Okay? So, it's the tragedy of the commons. Of Picture this metaphor. You've got an American and a Chinese person in a house that's burning. And the American says, you go first out of the house. The Chinese person said, no, no, you evacuate first. No, you, you, you. What's going to happen? They're both going down. And that's what's happening right now. However, right now the Chinese are a little smarter than us because they're number one in solar technology. They're number two in wind. So even though they're ramping up coal-fired power plants and they're polluting like crazy, they're actually using those profits to ramp up their renewables because they know it's coming. And in fact, China's going to get hurt with climate change worse and sooner than the United States. Now, unfortunately, we're in a democracy, they're in a dictatorship, so they can do whatever they want. So as Tom Breed and I had this conversation, it's an interesting experiment. Who's going to be ahead environmentally down the road? The country that has democracy or the country that was run by dictatorship? We're going to see. That's going to be an interesting experiment. I hope it's us. Okay. So, what can you do? Well, let me show you what I did. Let me show you what I did. Okay. I put LED bulbs in the lights in my house that are on for the longest which means the light that we put on in the living room when we're watching TV, that one's on usually for hours. And there's a candelabra over our dining room table. My wife and I sit on either end with our laptops. That's, that's where we work. So that light's on a lot too. Now, I was fortunate GE sent me a $50 LED bulb for the living room for free because they knew I was going to tell you about this and it's a good <laughs> common sense advertising for that. I did have to pay for the candelabra bulbs. Okay? They were $11 a piece. There were six of them. Imagine paying $66 for six little bent flame tip candelabra bulbs. You think that is crazy, right? They use two watts of energy. At LIPA's current rate, which I think is about 20 cents per kilowatt hour, I did the math. Those bulbs are paid for in four and a half years. And we say, wow, that's a long time. GE says they're guaranteed for 10 years, no questions asked. Home Depot, forever. I'm going to make money, but I'm going to do it in five years, and then it's free money after that. And the other nice thing is, that's also where I have my Friday night poker group. And in the <laughs> summer, the old bulbs were throwing off a lot of heat. That room got pretty hot. Now there's no heat. So that's really good. Now in the winter you want that heat, but anyway. Uh, and then all the other lights in my house are the little squiggly CFLs. They're much cheaper. They pay for themselves oftentimes in a year. Okay. The drawback to the CFLs is they take a little while to warm up, and you gotta dispose of them correctly because of mercury. The LEDs though are immediate. The drawback of an LED is it's fairly directional, meaning that 
you kind of have to aim it where you want it. It doesn't spread out like a bulb. So I'm not saying these light bulbs are wonderful, but they're wonderful for the bills. So I'm going to show you what I did here. I had $186 per month in February of 2008. February 2010, $147. My bill now is $109. Next year it'll be probably $92 or something like that. Has LIPA lowered their electric rates the last four years? <laughs> oh, no. I cut my bill in half when prices were going up. And here's what I did. Changed light bulbs, turned down the oil burner thermostat. Most of your oil burners are set at 180 over 160. You don't need it that hot. Put it to 160, 140, or be extreme. And I did 150, 130. Hot enough for a shower, hot enough for the baseboard, hot enough for the dishwasher. It's safer for children. I have two small children. Right? That saves a lot of energy. I had line-powered lights when I bought the house six years ago. I ripped them out. I put solar in there now. They're not quite as bright. You, know, you just stick them in the ground. <laughs> but I have not lost a poker player leaving my house yet. <laughs> okay? I put programmable thermostats. I have three zones. My wife isn't thrilled about this, but the upstairs is freezing cold during the day because nobody's up there. Last year, we had a brutally cold winter. My bill was lower. I said, how can this possibly happen? And I realized my two years ago, my two and a half, three-year-old was napping up there. So I had to turn the heat on for a couple of hours. Now he's not napping. There's nobody ever up there. Just turning that one zone down, my bill went down during a brutal winter. Okay, so these zones, it's huge. Since 2008, every appliance has been uh, traded up to Energy Star. The refrigerator, I bought a refrigerator last year. That refrigerator is saving me $263 per year. It will pay for itself in four and a half years. And you know refrigerators last forever. You can actually go to do a Google Energy Star calculator refrigerator. Put in your model and it will tell you how much you can save. Don't use the national average for electric rate. We're well above that. Use about 20 cents, I think, per kilowatt hour, or 18, something like that. Hang clothes on a line. I grill five days a week. Propane's definitely better than electricity. Okay. Uh, I don't suggest this because it takes a long time to recover windows. Windows are five figures. Okay. So, what are the solutions? Tell family and friends what you learned today. Turn off lights and TV when you're not in the room. Unplug those cell phone chargers. Even if you're not connected to a phone, they're drawing a little bit of power. Okay. Recycle, recycle, recycle. If you can, my friend here, Janati, he rides his bike every day to my class, rain or, or shine. Okay? So he doesn't care about gas prices. Probably doesn't even know what they are because he doesn't care. Okay? <laughs> and then students say, what's the single most important thing I can do to try to solve the problem? Register to vote and vote. If you think climate change is a very important issue, vote for people who also agree with that. Okay? I have a lovely assistant, my wife Kelly, is going to pass this out. I will give you all this sheet with these links. Please take a look at these. And then, this is huge. Tuesday, May 8th, in this room at 1230, and at night in the Shea Theater at 7, Dr. Michael Mann, he is arguably the most famous climate scientist on the planet. He's won a Nobel Peace Prize. He's an author, and he actually just won a European Geophysical Union prize called the Hans Osher Award that is essentially like an actor winning the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Academy Awards. It's the biggest prize you can get other than a Nobel. We got him here. He's also going to be signing the book if you want. He's speaking here at 12.30. If you want to come at 12.30, come at 12 at the latest. This place is going to be jammed. The theater at night, you'll definitely have seats there. That's at 7 o'clock. He's going to talk about climate change, but also the politics behind it and how some of these people are going after scientists for just doing their research. Okay? That is it for my lecture. I will be happy to answer questions. My students can sign in down here. We also have some lovely color pamphlets about the wonderful courses we teach here. So that is it for tonight. I will answer questions now. Thank you. I understand, but I will stay for every question if you want me to. Any questions? Yeah.